Hello, and welcome back to the Now I Know My NFTs, a not-so-scary guide to Web3 for creatives. I'm your host, Ariel Marie. Today, I am interviewing Courtney and Blake Shine. They are the founders of Of The Night, which delivered thematic party packages to doorsteps nationwide and has since evolved into Queens of the Night NFT collection. Courtney Nicholas is the founder of Disco Dining Club, where she produced theatrical and thematic food experiences worldwide that marry her love affair with counterculture with her love affair of raucous dinner parties. Courtney, <laughs> Courtney has been featured in LA Times, Playboy, Subvert Mag, Food, Wine, Oxygen Network, Forbes, and Hollywood Reporter, and has partnered with clients including Airbnb, Newhouse, and the Standard Hotels, and Red Bull. Blake Shine's North Star is exploring and celebrating the absurdity of life. She has clowned in Italy, thrown renegade comedy festivals in the desert, and delivered thematic party packages nationwide. As the creative producer of Dirty Bird and the co-founder of Of The Night, Blake Shine has designed immersive spaces for music festivals across the U.S., including Electric Forest, Desert Hearts, and Lightning in a Bottle. Now fully emerged in the K-hole of NFTs, Blake Shine is focused <laughs> on redefining how we gather both digitally and IRL. Welcome to the show, you two. Yeah, thank you. you. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited to jump in because my background is in theme parks, so immersive spaces. So just so yeah. fascinated to see how you guys made the pivot and what your journey has kind of been like. Could we begin with why web three like what value do you see in this space to even give it your time and energy and pivot kind of a project a business into the space do you want to start court or should i yeah I've, yeah i'll dive a little bit in uh, we have always focused our career on things that are tangible and tech has been this elusive entity that we mm -hmm. felt like we couldn't sink our teeth into we didn't have an access point into the tech world or that tech community. And so when Web3 sort of serendipitously fell into our lap, which I'm sure Blake will explain in more length, we saw it as this really beautiful creative bridge into the tech world and this opportunity for us to build our, our terminology, our dictionary of tech, something that wasn't allowed or offered to us, especially since we have dedicated most of our life to the creative, to the tactile, to things that are IRL. So it would be remiss if we hadn't dove into the deep end when it came to Web3 because it is new, because it is on the cusp of innovation, and really understand who we are and what our voice is in relationship to Web3. Yeah, well said. I also think we have to go back a little bit because Courtney and I, when events disappeared during COVID, we didn't really just like sit back and wait for them to return. We're like, okay, we want to still bring joy and community to our community who was then stuck inside. So that's what we started of the night. And we started bringing our party packages to people stuck inside. And when people started exploring new forms of community and digitally gathering through Web3, we're like, all right, well, then we'll follow you, you here. And I'm lucky to have a partner who is a developer and is pretty deep in the world of NFT. Then we had one wine-fueled evening on the roof and talking about Web3 and talking about the community. And like Courtney said, this new wave of innovation. And Courtney and I got to talking. We're like, well, then we want to be a part of it. We think that we have a strong voice in how we gather. And we wanted that voice to be represented in the tech space. And Web3, like Courtney said, was such an awesome creative bridge um, to explore it. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that insight with me. Yeah. Um, so on the show, we've talked a lot about like making sure that NFTs have a solid utility and like making them more valuable than just a JPEG. And I think you guys are doing a really interesting job with the Queens of the Night NFT project. Could you kind of share a little bit about your NFT and like the utility behind it? Yeah. So since Courtney and I do come from a background of events, we would be remiss if we did not have that be part of our utility. Um, and even though we were diving into this digital space, we definitely still wanted to bring something tangible of worth of value of utility to our NFTs. So when we decided what our art would be and what our collection would be, we translated what we already call ourselves, which is the Queens of the Night, which is actually named after a flower that blooms once a year on a full moon. 
And it's like this rock star flowers. People gather from all over the world in deserts to watch its flower bloom. We took inspiration from that and pulled physical traits from iconic queens, iconic party women throughout history and created this collection that honored them. We say we like to honor the women who stumbled before us. And so when we were trying to come up with the utility that also represented this collection as well, we thought of how do we still bring that joy and that spunk and that underground club community that we come from and how do we represent that as utility so we've thrown a series of events in los angeles that our holders actually have access to but because those are few and far between we wanted to have something that was still rewarding to our community in between our live events so our utility has ranged from having these digital party packages these party zines as we call them which are themed and have cocktail recipes and hangover tips and lookbooks and how to recreate this party in your home space, pulling inspiration from our actual packages that we deliver to people throughout the night. So we had those party zines and we have our digital microverse. If you want to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, with everything that we produce, whether it be Queens of the Night or of the Night or our respective careers beforehand, it's really important for us to maintain a level of authenticity uh, to be genuine with what we love and we know our community loves. And so we admittedly, I mean, we're not gamers. We don't come from the tech world. So our utility and says an expression of what we know and love, uh, which are parties. We are party girls. We want to bring the party to Web3. And so our utility is a reflection of that. But we also built this microverse in partnership with our incredible illustrator, Sliz. And it is an animated 2D world that's filled with all the kooky elements of our IRL events, plus things that you could only build in the digital space, like a rate your lizard room or a photo booth where you go in and you can have pasties put on your NFT. It's just, we wanted to really push the boundaries and use the digital space in a way where it should be used in a way where it's you express things that cannot be done IRL. I, and also bring that level of kookiness and whimsy and sense of humor that is really emblematic of all of our productions. So our utility really takes from a lot of different worlds, but it really is, it, the theme is the same. It's to really have an expression of that underground party mentality. That is awesome and so exciting. Your utility sounds so cool and I admire your ability to pivot from what you guys are truly like at your core known for and then pivoting into the digital space. I admire that about you guys. We really, Blake and I talk about this a lot, that we want to have fun doing what we do. Yeah. So we don't stray so far away from our own core values that it becomes this elusive entity that has nothing to do with the the foundation in which we built. So it's very important for us to continue to really advocate for that sense of fun and frivolousness and a freedom of character. It is all, everything we touch continues to have that, that central nervous system. That's awesome. Moving into technology and creativity. I know personally, I like to own that I'm a creative human being and I am hitting this wall of like, do I take the time to learn how to code my models in like the metaverse or do I like partner with technological people? So I'm kind of curious, how did you guys deal with that? Did you actually learn the technical side of jumping into Web3 or did you just bring on like people who like are technically savvy and you just stuck in your zone of genius? Yeah. Also, I love that you're talking about zone of genius because I just went through and have been categorizing everything I do for two weeks and putting it into my zone of excellence versus my zone of genius. Oh. So I'm really glad I'm just is, reading this media I, article. Wow. wow. I had yeah, not, never heard of this. I'll send it over to you, Courtney. My, my girlfriend just sent it to me. But it's a great question. I think that we are, especially in this industry and like a gig economy as well, we have this mentality of like, we have to be able to do everything to be legit, right? You, you have to be a singer, dancer, and actor. You have to do all of these things. And there is definitely that concern of coming into tech like, do we have a place in tech? Are we allowed to be in tech if we don't fully understand certain things? You know, and can we be in these, can we be on a podcast? Can we be leading these Twitter spaces when we don't know everything if we can't answer every question? And full transparency, there is a ton of tech that we don't understand in regards to coding, you know, because it's not our zone of genius. 
You know, I definitely like to understand and stay curious and ask questions when we are working with our developer as well. Um, and we watched a lot of things on YouTube as well. And truly like Twitter spaces are such a great place for communal learning. Um, but we definitely had the help of Jason and the team behind Bueno, who is our development team behind our collection. Um, and just try to ask the pertinent questions that, that we had the wherewithal and the ability to troubleshoot when things were going wrong. I know Sliz, specifically for Microverse, learned a bunch about coding, you know, in regards to how to, how to build a world, you know? So I think she is deeper in that world of what it meant from to go from an artist to truly understanding the tech better because she built this entire Microverse, obviously with the tools that was given to us from our developer. But there's a, a shit ton of, sorry, there is a slew, <laughs> a, a slew of stuff that I don't understand. And I, and I think that's okay. I'm giving myself, I'm giving us permission to it be okay. And that we still are very deserving to be in this tech space without fully understanding certain things or just like knowing how to do certain things. We also have this really unique luxury where we kept our team very, very close to home, you know, late yeah. I our close friends had already worked together. So that was a no brainer. Sliz, our illustrator is now a close friend of mine, but was a close friend of Blake's first. One of my best friends. Yep. So we work all together in the same loft. Most and our de my, the developer is my boyfriend. So yes. there's literally the four of us would be in the same space, working on this, sharing information and knowledge as well, and literally building it together. Which I, I, we understand is something that is not the norm, especially in this Web3 space where people are outsourcing oftentimes across the globe, um, working on different time zones, especially in your PST, then it's a, it can be quite the hoopla to be timed with somebody who's over in Europe or over in Asia. So we kept it very tight knit, almost accidentally. In a weird way, you know, it just yeah. all happened very organically, I guess is the word. So it has allowed us a little bit more freedom to make mistakes, to like to, to figure out as we go. But I, both Blake and I are huge fans. So just figure out as you go. I mean, if you just, if you continue to stall because you don't know, you'll stall for the rest of your life. So mm -hmm. just dive, just dive in, <laughs> ask questions. <later. laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. So inspiring to me and I'm sure to the people listening too, like to give them, yeah, just to be able to say like, don't get stuck and it's totally valid and totally okay if you don't fully understand all the technology because mm -hmm. you can still like kill it and like move in the space. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. So immersive experiences. I'm curious, what are three things that you focus on when curating your immersive experiences to make sure that they translate into the digital realm? Because you can't really utilize the five senses like we do in, in real life. So I'm of course. curious, like maybe like three things that you focus on when curating immersive experiences digitally. Yeah, you want it, we can basically like ping pong, Courtney. I think for one of my favorite things about world building and immersive design, they have something that I like to call Easter eggs, which is basically rewarding people um, who dive a little bit deeper. So basically our microverse has, you can come just for the DJ set, right? We have incredible DJ sets and you can literally just come in there and be able to kick it, look at the silly art and listen to a curated set for this experience. And that's surface level, right? And then there's little Easter eggs. The more and more you explore the microverse, as there is when we like to build um, experiences as well, like, oh, what's this over here? Rewarding for people who want to dive a little deeper. So if they want to go into the other room and you happen to walk around and go up to one of the lizards, you realize that you could actually talk to the lizard. You could actually ask the lizard questions. Same thing. There's little things left on the floor of the microverse. There's a bottle that you can pick up and pop champagne. If you go over to the photo booth, you can press a button and it put pasties on you. So wanting to add those deeper levels of the experience, much like the events that we throw that feel rewarding for if you want to dive a little bit deeper into our world. That, that's something that I think we've translated really well into our digital space. It also makes you want to come back for more. It's like any great experience where you then learn from other attendees that there was some other nook and cranny that you didn't notice. Then that's how you get these quote unquote repeat customers, which I would imagine might be a little bit difficult in a digital space uh, mm -hmm. because it is very 
it is what you see. So to create these hidden codes, yeah, we just keep the audience intrigued. And then when you start building and we build on it constantly, then there is this impetus to keep returning, keep coming back to this world that is continuing to become more and more whimsically chaotic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> another uh, thing that I, it's very important for the events I host and produce is a sense of a host and somebody who's just, actually just going to say that. Oh, yes, yeah. girl. <laughs> and it's somebody leading your way, holding your hand, but also somebody who's accessible to you if you have questions, if you don't exactly know where to take your next step. There is somebody there, somebody real that you can talk to. So it is very important for us to have that level of accessibility to our community, to be there, whether it be on Zoom or in the chat or some other way where we're corresponding with everybody in our microverse. And not only microverse, just us on social media, us when we were delivering the party packages, like we are always at our phones, always making sure that all questions, comments, concerns related to customer service are handled by us because it adds to that level of like, we got you, you know, we welcomed you. With totally. like, well, now we'll make sure that you feel comfortable. I think I would say also for maybe a third one to button it, you know, Courtney and I do come from this underground fringe sort of community and we want to have our microverse also be a safe space for people of our fringe community who are questioning their gender, their sexuality, and feel like they don't need to be the hottest person to get into one of these parties that a lot of these NFT collections are throwing. Um, so we really try to have that reflected in our microverse where it feels like a safe space of radical self-expression. Um, we've had trans DJs, incredible one, baby weight, come and perform. We have burlesque performances um, in our theater um, as well. And so just really want it to be hyper colorful, hyper inclusive, so that like people really can come and it feel like a cool underground club where people can totally express who they are. Yeah, it's interesting. People always ask like, how did you build your community? It's like, we didn't really build it. It just is us. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it raised us. You know? Yeah. So it's it's a natural it's thing. Cool. This, yeah. Everything that we know and love and eat and breathe. And so it just, it would be, a natural evolution to then have that same sense of vibrancy be reflected in our Web3 work. That's fantastic. Very powerful little nuggets, design nuggets. Jumping off of that, I thought when you guys were speaking, have you guys explored, and I apologize if you shared that you did, but have you explored like in real life activation? So like you're in playing in your metaverse, you pop something and then like say the champagne. You pop the champagne in the metaverse and then a champagne bottle is delivered to their door. Like, have you explored those type of in real life activations? So we've talked about this, the, and I don't know if it's so much for our community as for others, but there is still a level of anonymity in this tech space, you know, of, of having to reach out to somebody to ask for not only their identity, but also their physical address. You know, and I think that that doesn't get crossed too much in this NFT space, only like if people are ordering merch. But there was a level of conversation that we were having when we were talking about these party zines that we were releasing of, do we want to have people who have our unique traits, our rare traits, um, actually get tangible party boxes? And there was that having to then follow up with them, get their address, and if that NFT was then sold, do we then need to follow up with somebody else and also get their that address? And so we haven't really leaned into that sort of tangible utility outside of actually throwing an IRL event where people can come um, and experience it. So no, we have not done that yet, but that's definitely been a topic of conversation that we keep revisiting. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a totally valid point because in order for that to make happen, you have to like get these people's addresses. And then that's kind of the opposite of like the whole Web3 vibe. In the in perpetuity yep. utility is something that we, yeah, most people yeah. are on the tip of everybody's tongue right now. So that, as Blake said, that idea that if and when the NFT gets sold on secondary, what then if they are one of those that holds a rare trait and you have to deliver something tangible to them. It, it's just, I, I think these are questions that most people are working through right now. It's not just us. It's mm -hmm. all, it, it, it's a lot of collections that want to cross that divide between the digital and the IRL, but still have those open-ended puzzle pieces that we have to put into place. Totally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Totally. And I think so I just have this idea. Like you could explore like scents, a scent to walk <laughs> along. Oh yeah. That's the, yeah. We show we the scent thing. <laughs> We talk about scent constantly. For somebody who's constantly. not in the perfume world, we talk about it a lot. <laughs> yeah. Well, especially because like like we like I mentioned, like we are named after this flower, mm -hmm. which is the combination kind of scent of like jasmine and gardenia. And so we have been in talks with <laughs> a number of people in regards to actually having a custom queen of the night scent. <laughs> so you have definitely been <laughs> yeah, you're definitely touching on things that we have talked about multiple times. So cool. Since you've started throwing these digital events, how are you finding people adapting to a digital space? Like, are people really wanting to spend time in digital realms just yet? Or at least like your community? Are you finding that they're really wanting to spend time in there or not quite yet? I think I'm, it's kind of a mixed bag. You know, I'm like, oh, no, it's definitely like, it's a crapshoot at times. <laughs> You know, it's it's hard and we we do need to be super honest with ourselves of like what we're coming out of. We're coming out of a space where we could only meet digitally, right? Because everybody was stuck inside. And so we, you know, that was a really cool opportunity to be redefining how we gather digitally. But now the world is opened up, you know, and, and as this was happening, Courtney and I's our independent lives of throwing live events. Um, also started coming back. And so we started seeing people actually buy tickets to our tangible events right now. And so I think, you know, we went from one extreme to the other, you know, and there's so many events happening right now. So many festivals, so every day, you know, every night something's happening that you can go to. And so I think right now we're, we're in the extreme um, of what people not wanting to be behind their computer any longer than they have to be. And wanting to be in respect of that. And so I think right now there's definitely a lull of people wanting to have these digital experiences. And I think that it will definitely kind of even out once we've exhausted being out as, as many nights as possible. It's the summer of crypto, as Blake really prophetically said during a Twitter space. She's like, I wonder how this is all going to be reflected when us... Us creators who are so used to going out and making sure that we like tap into all different aspects of culture also have to deal with being behind a computer, uh, which is mm -hmm. like sometimes 24 seven in the immersive world of web three. So I think we are just now trying to like sort through that. Uh, I think that the, the rise of NFTs has a lot to do with the fact that we were stuck inside the fact that we didn't have options. So what now when people have options? How do you navigate this world and how do you then intersperse Web3 into just the common day to day? Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your perspective on that. What is one piece of advice that you would give to an experienced designer or an immersive designer who's curious about Web3 and would like to jump in? I would first say to really dive into what crypto is. You know, first, like, I wish that we, I had done like a little bit more research, you know, and really is, a, do you believe in a decentralized banking system? Mm -hmm. You know, before like you kind of get into the world of NFTs, I think you need to also discover like, where does that sit with you? You know, the basis of what NFTs and what, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all of them are. And then if that's something that resonates with you, then why not try it? Like, this is such an interesting time to be alive that is so specific to this time, this moment, that it feels thrilling, I think, to be a part of something, to be on the cusp of the wave of innovation and something new. I also think if you believe in anarchy, this is the space for you to, <laughs> to be trying something new. Also, I wish that I had done a little bit more research in regards to the time that it takes. You know, starting an NFT collection, there's so much outside of just pure creative and pure creative expression. It's, it's being in these Twitter spaces, it's learning how to market yourself. You know, what's so great is you are cutting out this middleman and having direct contact with people who will be purchasing your art, but it also makes you your own publicist, your own salesperson, your own community manager, you know, and what does that mean to be available to your community, to answer questions, to defend your art, to defend your utility. So I think it's just important to really kind of reflect on how does this sit in your life? Do you have the time to do it? Do you really believe in the foundation of it? And if it sounds thrilling to you, then I am a huge advocate of trying it. 
despite all the anonymity, there is this, there's that word, shocking sense of accessibility with people in Web3. So I really do find it crucial to find those mentors, those figureheads that you are a fan of what they're producing, whether it be in the digital space or the NFT collection that they produce and reach out to them. I mean, for whatever reason, Twitter, people DM you back, totally different than Instagram and Facebook and whatever, whatever else people use these days. But it, it's important to really like harness those people that you enjoy because that will add to your your level of comfortability when you're using and starting to use these NFT jargon words. Mm -hmm. Totally. I also truly do think that NFTs have a place in events in the future, 100% in regards to just ticket sales and concert tickets. And um, I think at one point you're going to be able to see who has the tickets in your same row, you know, and choose not only based upon your, your seat and your viewpoint to a stage, but also who's sitting next to you and being able to look at people's profiles and curating and based upon like who's surrounding you. And so I think for immersive designers and event producers, it's also just a really interesting thing, at least to just have the wherewithal to kind of understand it and just be aware of its evolution. Yeah, we're hyper aware that this is divisive as fuck. Like, you know, we yeah, don't totally hate it. Hate it. There's no in between. Yeah. And we both look forward to those that are adverse, at least being able to take in the knowledge bank, at least understanding that this this technology is here to stay uh, and might evolve in terms of the actual name of it. So it's a little bit more subversive. <laughs> but this shouldn't be something that is so jarring that you have to sort of push it aside. There, there's a happy medium there. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm sure like, like everything else that you guys shared, like just super inspiring to other designers or immersive designers trying to figure out this like pivot or where they could possibly fit in. So thank you for sharing. Courtney and Blake Shine, you guys are fantastic. So kind, so generous. So thank you so expansive so inspiring and i think your projects <laughs> that you are doing and the pivot that you're doing is so wonderful and yeah thank you for sharing your time and energy with me today and sharing your beautifully expansive explorative knowledge with us i really appreciate it i know you inspired me and oh, definitely okay. to the people listening so thank you so so much appreciate thank that you thank you so much I, we love talking about what we do it gives us a, that that sense of adrenaline moving forward. Yeah, yeah, it is truly. Awesome. Well, thank you for tuning in. I hope you guys have a beautiful rest of your day and I will see you inside the next video. Bye.